Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for attending today's session. Um, much appreciated. Um, there are going to be um, some uh, two presenters today. It'll be myself and my colleague Tony Seaton, and we'll be running through what are the options available really for funding for growth. So Tony's going to kick off in a second with, "Is your business ready for investment?" And then you'll you'll hear my dulcet tones come back in again to talk about what the funding options are, the types of finance are available, and how best to approach them. So again, without further ado, so we can crack on, I'm going to pass over to my colleague Tony. Tony. Do you want to take it up from here? Thanks, Paul. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, I'm Tony Seaton. I'm one of the client directors based at the Bromsgrove office of Jerome's, and we work hard to help clients raise money. I think in the, particular in the current times, it's important to actually make sure you're ready when you approach a funder for finance, because uh, the statistics have proven that if a, a well-presented proposal gives you far more chance than if you're just going cold and, and it's difficult times at the moment. So what we're trying to give you is a few tips as to what to prepare. So when you go and meet the bank, the other funder to give you the best possible chance. OK, so we'll crack on now with the investment a checklist, Paul. The first one is sort of a little checklist of things to look at. And to start, we're doing this in two ways. First of all, for early startup businesses, and the second one for sort of more established businesses looking for growth capital. So, if you're an early stage or you've got an idea, have you got a company incorporated? What what's the investment vehicle you're going to use to actually do it? The key thing is, have you assessed the market demand for your product? Britain is great at inventing things, coming up with good ideas. But will anybody buy it? Have you got some potential customers in place? That's important. And that's what all funders will look for is not is it a good idea, but are we actually going to be able to sell this product and make some money out of it at the same time? Tied in with that is your personal investment and credit rating. How many of you regularly look at your credit rating? Do you, are you aware of your credit rating? There's a number of free websites out there. You can keep track of your credit score. It's important to do that because most funders at some stage will do a credit rating on you. So it's again, it's all part of the process of being prepared. If there is anything there that you shouldn't um, be, be on there, you can probably deal with it before it, um, it causes a problem. Things like old mobile phone contracts sometimes have been issues with causing people to be having a bad credit record, but they can be dealt with, but it's being prepared. Have you got a prototype or a beta version of your product? Most people, they don't want to just look at an idea these days. They want to actually have a feeling that it's working, it's going forward. Before the prototype version, you're probably talking about family and friends. Um, or intellectual property, the next one. Have you got any patents, trademarks? It's not always, it's, it's great if you can get a patent or a trademark. It's not always the best idea. They can be expensive. So you need to assess that against going to the market. Then the, the collateral you need when you get people, the business plan, uh, they vary extensively, but traditionally now they are getting shorter in recent times, probably 15 to 20 pages maximum. Um, I keep it punchy. It's very much of a presentation. It's a sales documentation, not every last piece of detail. Um, an integrated financial forecast. So you've got the profit and loss account, the cash flow and the balance sheet. They are all one document. They are, should not be presented separately. They need to be working with each other. Do you have the required skills to do the project? Do you need to do somebody else? You might need an accountant. You don't need, probably need one in-house because of that tech, but there's plenty of people, people like Jones, we're happy to help early stage businesses, but it's having somebody that can use those skills and what resources are required, labor facilities, have you got any security for the loan? Do you want to give security for the loan? A lot of people don't. And there's an awful lot of different types of security. It doesn't necessarily mean your house is on the line, but it's just something you need to understand. And certainly on the equity side, there's tax reliefs available for investors, the EIS and the SEIS. You can get advance insurance from those subject to certain conditions. It's worth looking at. It's again, something that we can help you with through the process, but uh, make sure you've considered it at least before you go on. To the next stage. Okay, the next one. You'll probably find this very similar. This is for more established businesses. And it's a lot of it is about housekeeping. 
Have you kept? Your, is everything up to date? Have you done your last statutory accounts? Have they been signed off? Yes, you don't have to file them for nine months or 12 months with the current um, regulations, but they can be prepared, updated. It just shows that you're keeping track of your books. Have your corporation tax sorted? Management accounts, you need to know where you are with your business, uh, what your latest position is, what's the latest trading, particularly in these current times. A set of accounts from last March will not count for a lot. Everybody will want to know what's happened over the last six months. What do you think is going to happen over the next six months? Is your intellectual property up to date? It's not about to expire. Is it in the right name? Is it in the name of the company? Is it your personal name? Should you be transferring it? Again, it's something to consider. There's no right or wrong answer, and it may be best to keep it in your personal name to protect it, but some investors will want it in the company. Similar to the other one is the credit rating of the company and the directors. Again, company credit ratings, they produce some funny results occasionally. We see them for no apparent reason. People's credit rating suddenly changes, um, and, but the credit reference agency can always look at it. So again, beware what your credit agency rating is before you start. We can help you people with get them if you can't find them directly. Then the, the other point is the business plan, as we talked about previously, we'll come back to that. The financial forecasts, the labor, what are you going to spend the money on, security, and the tax insurance is very similar to the startup businesses. So they're the sort of collateral you should be thinking about before you even approach an investor. So we'll now cover off a couple of those points in a bit more detail. How, financial forecasts, we see all sorts of financial forecasts in many shapes, forms, um, ranging from backs of a bank packet to a 300 page Excel spreadsheet. Um, they are three distinct but related uh, statements which should be integrated. And what I mean by that is the profit loss count, the balance sheet and the cash flow. So if you alter one of them and we have a set of key assumptions at the front of the forecast, if we alter a key assumption, say for example the sales, the selling price, the cost of the goods, it will automatically flow through the whole of the model and also funders can run sensitivities to understand what is happening. It's important that those assumptions are clear and easy to see and not hidden within the model. So we always prefer a front page of key assumptions which drive the full model. It shouldn't be an exercise in Excel skills. It's mostly can be done with simple plus minus equals and linking the sheets together and VAT. But the key assumptions and narrative, and this is where it's important is the business plan is also part of that document. So if you say in your business plan, you're going to recruit somebody in month six, make sure that your forecasts recruit somebody in month six. And the biggest issue we often see with people is they um, update one of the plans, the business plan, they suddenly change their mind, but they don't bother changing the forecast. And then when somebody gets them, they're inconsistent and you lose credibility. Again. It's all a case of credibility, funders, how short of time it's making sure you get it right the first time round. And, and moving on, Paul. So before you start your forecast, what do you need done? You need to correct opening position. The number of forecasts we see with a zero, zero starting point, assuming nothing's ever happened. That may be the case in the startup business, albeit unlikely. You probably put some funding in yourself to get the business to where it is today. Have you got your last statutory accounts? If so, start from those. Or if you've got some up-to-date reliable management accounts, start from those. Don't leave a gap period. That's what we often see too many times. We'll get a set of management accounts, for example, to March, and then the figures will start in August. And miraculously, nothing's changed between March and August. I'm sure it has. Um, let's just have some credibility to make sure it all flows through. Again, it's, it's been that been out to see with it. So start with your closing management accounts. Any funding you've got in there at the moment, you might, if you're a young business, you might have a startup loan, current climate, you might have a bounce back loan. Make sure they're all fully fun, built into your model. People understand what your existing liabilities are, and then we can build around that for the new funding. But funders will always want to be aware of the borrowings, any capital repayments, any interest which they relate to. Um, the several for formats of forecasts available. Excel, build them yourself relatively quick and easy to build or you can get bespoke packages they tend to be expensive um, and the logic's not clear so my advice is always to use an excel spreadsheet if at all possible so your financial forecasts the key assumptions um, 
turnover calculations, try and do it by the number of units, number of users, for example, so break it down so it's easy to do. Are you going to have 50 customers, an average sales value of Y, and all those sort of things you can then change easily as you go through. The cost of sales or your direct costs, try to link them to the number of units sold, the turnover, so we can actually see when if the turnover changes, the costs automatically change as well. So overheads, make sure you include the employees, all the employees we talked about in the business plan. A lot of people think that cash equals profit. That is by far the one biggest mistake that people make, that the profit forecast is the same as the cash flow forecast. You're probably going to have to buy stock, particularly if you're buying it from overseas. Could be three months before you sell it. You've got to finance it. Your customers tend to pay slower than you pay your suppliers, particularly in the early days. Capital expenditure, also VAT. If you're buying a property, most properties have VAT on them, and that would need to be funded for at least a month, potentially three months. Normally, financing can be done on property deals. Very straightforward. The banks will do it, but it's something that you should consider. Don't wait till the last minute. So, have you move on to the next slide now? So, what issues do we sometimes have with forecasts? The opening position doesn't agree to anything. I don't think that comes back to our point we made earlier, making sure your statements um, tie into the management accounts. Narrative in the business plan doesn't back up the forecast again, make sure everything's in time. Step changes, a lot of people suddenly say we move from year one to year two, and suddenly things double because it's the start of a new year. Things tend to be more of a gradual curve, they don't suddenly happen. Three years is a normal sort of forecast level that people require, and monthly. Year one, hopefully you have a pretty good feel for. Year two is a bit of a guess. Year three, you're hoping for, you're hoping what's going to happen and things may change before then. What else are you looking for? You run out of money in early years. A lot of people only look at the annual totals. So it's great, we've got money at the end of year one, we've got money at the end of year two. Oh, whoops, we went bankrupt in month 17, but nobody bothered looking at that. You, you need to think of it through the monthly cycles, how it works. Ignoring VAT, a lot of people do that, but it can have a big cash flow effect. A silly one, but the things that we see a lot of times is, how many times have you ever had an Excel spreadsheet, you press the print button and it says printed one of 200 pages, just because you haven't bothered to set in the print settings correct? I think we've all done it in our time, but there's nothing more annoying for a funder when if you can't actually look at the forecast and make, make common sense of it. I'm as guilty as anybody else, I've done it in the past. So um, just actually spend 10 minutes making sure it all makes sense at the time. Too much detail. Don't get bogged down in detail. We, we don't want a 200 page um, spreadsheet with the last paperclip being spent. It's broad headings. You, it's, a, it's a forecast at the end of the day. Things won't happen exactly as you said. Um, so be careful of that. Um, and they don't add up. We all do these wonderful Excel formula spreadsheets, and then somebody says, OK, I just want to change one number. You go and put an absolute value somewhere in the middle of your forecast, and it screws it all up, and everything goes to pieces. You carefully work model. So once you've set up that model, it works. Only use the assumption changes at the beginning. Don't be tempted to suddenly change something halfway through the model. Otherwise, it will cause immense problems. So moving on. We talk a bit about the business plan. Um, they've certainly evolved us in my sort of while I've been in corporate finance in the last probably 20 years. They used to be wealthy tombs of 100 pages that we'd we'd go through and wonder what on earth it all meant at the end of the day. Um, and now it's very much so. And I've even seen some in recent days we didn't have any words. They were just pictures selling the concept. That's probably going to an extreme. I still favour a few words. Give us a bit of a clue what you're doing. But it's very much initially the funder. It's a flyer, a marketing document, two or three pages, gives the key points, probably just a quick graph of where the turnover and financials are going, just to see whether they've got any interest before they get get bored and carried away. Then we can move to the full plan once we've got some interest received, and that should be a concise document as we said earlier, 15 to 20 pages max. Um, everybody has a different question to ask, so don't try and think of everything because. Even if you write 100 pages, someone will still come up with another question. So we can't think of everything, but get the main points across. And now I'll, I'll cover sort of what the main points are to go in that business plan. So this is the executive summary to start with, which really is a summary of the following sections, probably one or two pages. Then the history and background, a bit about where the company's come from, why you did it, what made you come up with it. The best ideas are often because you had a problem yourself 
and you try to solve it. Um, it shows there's a need for it. Again, one or two pages, product and supply chain, tell people a bit about your product, how are you going to do it? Do you need it? third parties? What, who are you reliant on? Are you manufacturing it yourself? Again, one or two pages. Markets and customers, probably the most important section of the business plan. Who is going to buy your cost product? And are they going to buy it at the right price? Um, I've seen a lot, you see a lot of examples where people would like the product, but it might be okay at five pounds, but they're not prepared to pay 10 pounds. Do a bit of market research amongst people see whether you can actually sell it. Is it the right price? What are your competitors charging? Um, assuming you can go in at a low price and then rapidly increase prices when you come established can be a little naive at times because people get used to low prices. So carefully thinking about your pricing structure is important and, and the logic behind that. Organisation structure, uh, that's the management team. How's the company? Who, who owns the company? Who runs the company? Don't worry if you haven't got a full management team, certainly at early stages, most businesses won't because they can't afford a full three or four person board of directors. But just know that you've got the weakness or there's a, there's a gap in the system. Let people know what it is and how you're going to deal with it. You might have an HR consultancy to deal with HR matters. Very few companies have an HR person these days unless they're quite large. Financial directors, a lot of those are not a part time not or consultants. You don't need them necessarily full time. Financial summaries in the actual business plan, probably just a couple of pages um, or so with historic forecasts, um, uh, historics and the forecasts. If you can do it graphically, even better. Um, don't worry about doing lots of detailed numbers, graphs. Everybody can read graphs and charts a lot easier than they can numbers. So perhaps just a, a table of historic turnover and more of profits. Probably don't do them on the same graph because otherwise profits look so small compared with turnover, but do them on different scales. You can get some lovely graphs, makes it look pretty good to the eye. And then the final one, certainly if you're having an equity investment, it's the exit strategy. Um, who's going to buy the company going forward? And quickly moving on, we're nearly there. Yes, sir, no, I think that's the bit that Paul will now actually talk through some of the ways of uh, where we can actually get all this money from when we've done our forecast and plans. I'm Paul Heaven. I'm the director of um, uh, Jerome's Corporate Finance. Uh, along with Tony, uh, we've been in this business for 20 plus years. And I'm going to run through the funding options, how best to us access them, you know, what types of finance there are available, you know, what are they looking for, how to approach them, and then hopefully, time permitting, we'll do some stuff on, um, um, you know, what, um, uh, uh, what we can do in terms of uh, things to watch out for. OK, so without further ado, we'll run into it. So what are the types of finance that are available um, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, types of finance available that, that there are really three and have only ever really been three key types of finance in the market, which is grants, debt and equity. The, the observant amongst you will have spotted a fourth on there, which I'm going to cover off. And, and I think it's an interesting and increasingly used form of finance, which is called mezzanine. And almost as its name implies, really sits between debt and equity. So when we get down to that, we'll have a look at what the particular features are of mezzanine finance and how that might suit the project and the plan you have um, at hand. OK, so grant finance in terms of, um, uh, oh, by the way, sorry, let me just go back. I, I meant to say that one of the things that we tend to skip over when we're doing these kinds of uh, presentations is the idea that uh, although I'm treating each of these binary, I'm going to look at them each one in turn, um, the idea that projects or growth plans are funded by exclusively one type of finance is probably the exception and not the rule. So just keep in mind that although we're looking at each of these in turn, your project or your plan or your idea may actually require a combination of, of, of more than one of these types of finance and, and that we call the blend and when things get a little bit more complicated in terms of how we best bring those, those elements in. Grant finance, so best type of finance, typically no obligation to repay. There is a slight exception to that if you fail um, to deliver 
fundamentally on what the project was intending to do, then there might be what is known as a clawback obligation. Um, because it is the best type of finance and there's typically no obligation to repay, then you won't be surprised to hear that demand almost always massively exceeds supply. Um, the grant itself will have some kind of output requirement and, and I'm sad to say this, but very often that output requirement can can kind of not infrequently defy business logic. So quite commonly, for example, an output requirement is the number of jobs being created, whereas the project you may be considering may be one where you're looking to improve the business efficiency and and thereby maybe, um, you know, create job savings. So you need to be mindful of what the output requirements are. They're generally non-negotiable um, and whether they defy business logic or not, you can either meet them or you can't. It tends to be a fairly binary decision and logic with, you know, you either meet the requirement or you don't. And and I've sat in on, on um, you know, grant awarding bodies and, and, and unfortunately that, that kind of is the way these things are looked at. You know, the project either meets the grant objectives or it doesn't. Keep in mind the principle of relative merit and this is probably the only type of finance where this this issue comes to the fore which is that keeping in mind that there's almost certainly going to be greater demand than supply then how do how do the grant awarding bodies determine which projects get the finance and which ones don't? Well they basically stack them up together and see which one has the best you know, possible delivery outcome or opportunity or prospects relative to the scheme's logic. So you might meet the grant requirement in every respect, um, but it doesn't mean there isn't another application out there that isn't better than yours in terms of the number of jobs it creates or the carbon uh, savings it makes and so forth. Obviously, we're moving, you know, a lot of, a lot of programs, um, a lot of grant programs originate through the a European Union and in, and, and in particular through the um, the European Regional Development Fund ERDF and um, and I know this is not a you know a political statement we are moving uh, into a period where um, you know the future is a little uncertain as to what programs might be supported um, the final bullet point on that particular slide is that we are in the process of launching it should be available within the next month um, a Jerome's grant finding service so we will be offering to all of the Jerome's clients an opportunity to approach us to determine what grants might be suitable to a project that they're considering undertaking um, with no obligation to use Jerome's to to assist in the application for that grant but if you know clearly we'll be there if you need our help we then get into debt and again I could spend the next you know never mind 30 minutes I could spend the next 30 hours talking about all the different types of debt <clears throat> and um, so I'm going to try and categorize them in in a kind of broad brush approach so debt is a you know, is, is a facility, is, is a form of finance which has an obligation to repay. It comes in numerous forms, higher purchase, lease, and I notice mortgage isn't even listed there, and that's probably the most common one that you'll all be aware of. There'll be term loans, revolving finance facilities, invoice discounting factoring, supplier or supply chain finance, payroll import finance. So there's a lot of different forms of debt. It's a couple of um, current government back loan schemes, a, a number of which are specifically aimed at tackling the uh, lockdown and COVID-19 implications, most notably the um, sea bills, um, the um, coronavirus um, and, and the bounce back loan scheme. Um, uh, sea bills is technically due to end at the end of September. Um, uh, bounce back loan is due to end at the end of October. Um, I think there's possibility, I don't want to kind of predict that, but both or either might get extended. Um, uh, there's 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 also the enterprise finance guarantee scheme from which really C bills comes in, in, in the sense of its 
design and style. So it's a government and a guarantee back loan scheme. There's also some local and regional financing in, in each area, most notably in the um, in the Midlands area, the Midlands Engine Investment Fund or MEIF. And in addition to that, there's crowdfunding and peer to peer lending and some for smaller loans, some community development financed institutions or CDFIs that will typically lend up to maybe uh, 150k um, depending on the nature of the project. Debt tends to split into two categories which is secure debt and unsecured debt and I'm just going to just point out here I mean secure debt is asset backed it's you know there's some kind of security that's been called upon by the lender um, you know be that property plan you know, receivables, debtors, inventory maybe. Um, and um, and just to pick up on those areas, just be mindful of the fact that when they're looking at your receivables as security, there will be what are known as concentration limits. So they'll be looking at um, not wanting to over expose themselves to any one individual debtor. Um, so there will be a kind of rule that says, well, we'll offer you a facility of a million pound, but uh, no one debtor can exceed a certain level. And that's known as a concentration limit. Inventory, there'll be some conversion risk to them. So inventory finance is quite difficult to get. It's notoriously um, tricky these days. And, and the conversion risk really is just what the lender's looking at in terms of their ability to be able to sell that inventory in the hopefully unlikely event that the loan ever goes into default. There's fixed and registered charges. There'll be floating charges on the company. And when I put down the, the bullet point there, that there's a kind of belt and braces approach don't be surprised that you'll find that if um, lenders, even though they might be looking to secure the loan against plant or debtors, that they also seek a floating charge on the remaining assets of the business. It tends to be a feature these days of most lenders that they will seek to get whatever, um, you know, whatever security is available to them. Now, this is a bit of a peculiarity because you won't see it this way, but most lenders will regard a loan that's backed by a person personal guarantee as actually unsecured debt. I mean, most lenders, most most borrowers rather, will, will see the very reverse of that and be very nervous about giving a personal guarantee. And to add insult to injury, they'll find that the lender will actually be saying, well, actually, um, that doesn't give us very much in the way of security at all. In fact, in banking circles, we regard that as unsecured debt. But effectively, it's just there's no fixed or absolute registered charge against a given asset. Um, uh, but but the bank is working on the basis that they'll call in the um, security of the of the person seeking the loan in the event of default. They, they may seek, and it'll depend on the nature of the, the debt that's being sought, but they may seek a charge over the owner of managed property. It's increasingly less common these days that lenders do that. Um, um, and, and incidentally, the whole idea of personal guarantee or a personal risk is actually the lenders um, assessing the extent to which the owner manager of the business has what is rather unkindly re referred to as skin in the game. So they're really looking at making sure that as a borrower, you've got some personal commitment to make sure that that, that, um, that, that security, that the, the loan is, is ultimately serviced and repaid. And they do use um, interest rate to price risk. So the less security, or sorry, let me give you the more positive way, the more security that's available to them, the lower the rate of interest. Conversely, of course, that's also true the other way around. Um, and then the, the third, perhaps most common type of finance is equity. And again, that's share of ownership of the business. Uh, typically, there's no security required when, when an equity investment's made. Um, it's not generally called upon to be serviced, although in reality, they may structure the deal, and I'll come to what that means in a minute. But, but typically, there isn't repayment requirement. Um, the the lender will see themselves as committed to the business rather than involved. And I guess the 
the best analogy I've ever heard of that is the um, is the analogy of the Great British Breakfast and the um, and the statement that the um, the chicken was involved but the pig was committed. So you'll see the point there. So in in terms of commitment, they'll see themselves as committed to the business. Um, it's more complicated to arrange, and you know, and I would err on the side of caution. It takes probably three to six months as a minimum really to to put that into place. Um, there will be some there will be a document called the shareholders agreement or investors agreement. And in most cases they'll also look to amend the articles. And they're not doing that because they're just, you know, kind of weird people that feel that they owe a debt of gratitude to lawyers. It's really to do with the fact that they'll be looking to to protect their interests. Remember, they're investing in the share capital of the company, very often taking a minority stake. Um, and so therefore, they'll be looking to protect their, 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 their position there really through the investor or shareholder agreement. It's not uncommon. It depends on the size of the investment, but they may seek um, to appoint a non-exec director to the board. Um, in theory, really, just to keep an eye on the business, to report back to them, but also hopefully to add value. I mean, during the assessment stage of whether they want to make this investment, they'll be looking at the strengths and weaknesses of the pre-existing management team. And if they feel there are some management weaknesses, they may try and plug those by recommending a non-exec director with the skills that are they perceive as being missing within the management team. Um, it is high risk and high return. I mean, it, you know, at the end of the day, investing in the um, in a minority share capital in a private company is not exactly a, a guaranteed way of making your, your return back. So they will expect higher returns. So it is the most costly kind of money and the, the returns, depending on the scale of the nature and where you're at in your business development, are going to be in the order of 30% plus. And in order to be able to achieve that, they'll really only be backing business with significant growth potential and an opportunity to scale. So if yours is a, a very niche market, um, then they'll need to be satisfied that there's sufficient capacity for you to grow in that market for them to be able to achieve those kinds of returns. Um, and they'll also be looking for businesses with an exit plan. And I do mean an exit plan. In other words, what are we going to be doing? Remember the way they make their money back on an equity investment is they put the money in and then hopefully the business sells in, you know, somewhere in the range of three to seven years and, and they make their return on their investment through that exit. So it doesn't really all go well and I don't recommend um, going into um, an equity investment when you don't have a clear intention and, and some idea of how that exit might occur. Um, dealing with one at the moment, for example, that came through a couple of days ago, where the, um, if you like, the husband and wife who own the business want me to offer to the potential equity investors the option of them buying them back out subject to the business plan being achieved and I'm having to advise them and I just don't think that's going to sit well with potential equity investors so I think it needs to be um, a true commitment to exit rather than uh, you know a way of trying to um, um, you know kind of buy the business back if you like. I did say I would talk about mezzanine as, as previously kind of trailed really it sits between equity and unsecured debt um, it, it, it um, it tends to, and I, I use this terminology carefully, it tends to be a loan with an, with an equity risk. Um, now, I find it can be quite attractive and, and it is becoming a bit more common, the um, um, amount of money in the market. I mean, I'll give you all a, for instance, um, where I think mezzanine is ideally suited. So if a business is 50-50 owned, which is quite a common feature or even it's entirely family owned which is again a common feature not least around the um, the Midlands um, then actually coming in as a 20 percent or maybe a 25 percent shareholder into a family owned business can be a pretty daunting prospect and the same is true if um, if it's a 50 50 owned company as a, an equity investor in that situation you fear that one day you're going to be called upon to choose between two sides so bring, putting money in in the form of 
um, what is effectively a debt instrument, but taking equity risk, um, can somehow balance the 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 the, the, the if you like the complications of the two so there will generally be a service obligation it'll look like debt really there'll be an, an, a service obligation simply means that there's a there's a requirement to repay um, there may be a one-year holiday exceptionally a two-year holiday on repayment so keeping in mind that you're raising this money for growth you don't really want to find yourself in a situation where having raised it you're instantly having to repay it so a one-year or a two-year repayment holiday can be useful and then the way they price the risk in to um you know to the repayment terms is they'll either look for what's known as an equity option or very frequently referred to as an equity kicker um, or they'll have a redemption premium um, now what do those two things mean well an equity kicker is the option usually to take an equity stake um, very often at a nominal amount of money but only when the business does sell so the debt provider is basically saying, right, OK, I'll, I'm going to put a million quid into your business and I'm going to expect you to repay that. Um, but by the way, uh, because I'm putting this in at a stage where the risk I'm taking is similar to that of a, an equity investor, then what I'm going to want you to do is give me an option over, I don't know, pick a number, 10 percent, 20 percent, 15 percent of your equity. But I don't want it now. I don't want to get involved in the management of your business. I don't want to side between the two 50-50 shareholders or navigate the, um, the shark infested waters of a family dispute. What I'm going to do instead Instead, I'm going to I'm going to take an option for a pound that when you sell this business, I get 10% of the equity the day before you sell. Another common way of dealing with it is redemption premium. Um, and a third way is the equity conversion right. A redemption premium is simply a lump sum payable at the end of the loan. So in other words, you repay the loan in normal terms and at the end of it all, depending on how quickly you've repaid it, um, there's, a, there's a redemption premium to pay. Um, the equity conversion option simply allows me to convert my loan if another, if a slab of equity comes in from somewhere else. Anybody that's seen the um, the government future funds uh, scheme will know that the equity conversion option is the way they've they've dealt with the um, mezzanine implications there so it's it's still looking for a high return it'll typically be a risk premium of 20 percent plus it's a little less risky maybe than pure equity because as long as the business doesn't fail then the debt will get serviced or repaid over its life there are relatively few providers um, like i mentioned the future fund scheme is particularly good one um, and again you know post EU um, there is there is I suppose there's an indication um, and the future fund scheme is an example of this although there was another scheme run prior to the future fund scheme which gave a kind of precursor to this idea but there is a hint at least that rather than grant money the UK government favours the idea of some kind of a mezzanine structure to support ideas. So you've got a brand new idea, you've invented something new, um, and uh, the idea being that rather than give you a grant to see where that goes, the government puts the money in the fund, some kind of a mezzanine structure. So if it fails, well, it fails, they would have lost their money anyway. If it succeeds, uh, then they get to convert their um, contribution into some kind of an equity share um, in the future of that product or idea going forward. So I'm not, I can't say I'm predicting it, but I think there's enough reason to believe that the future of UK government support may well take the form of some kind of a mezzanine instrument. So what kind of things are they looking for? Well, in terms of grants, and this goes back to Tony's comments and, and, his, and his stuff that he, he, he precursed on what goes into your um, business plan or pitch deck, as I would refer to it. Um, and this is an extremely important point, albeit, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's kind of made at the bottom of the slide. I mean, you'll see that what the different fund providers are looking for is quite different. 
um, you know, in terms, I mean, the obvious one is just to compare grants and debt. So in terms of grants, yeah, okay, the scheme will have a theme um, and that theme might be innovation or green, low carbon, sustainability, or have some output. But here's the key words. It's looking for leading edge. It's looking for high risk. It's looking for stuff that's new and innovative and it's going to generate uh, intellectual property for UK PLC. <clears throat> now compare and contrast that with the final three or final four really um, words on the on the on the debt slide: reliability, certainty, steady, low risk. Um, so instantly you can answer that kind of um, that question at the bottom of the slide. Do I use the same pitch deck when I approach my bank manager for the project and I'm approaching the government on the same project for a grant? Definitely not, because you're just going to be sending the wrong messages to one or the other of them. You could almost regard in the context of this slide as equity fitting sort of in the middle, really. I mean, it's looking for high growth for the reasons I've already mentioned and the ability to scale. It's looking for innovation and, and IP. And it wasn't a mistake that it goes down there as management, management, management. In fact, there was a survey done uh, it's a little while ago now of venture capitalists and what were the key things that they were looking for when they were determining whether to make um, an investment and what came back overwhelmingly was management, management, management or people, people, people. I mean effectively what an equity providers do is backing the management team of the business to to see whether they, you know, whether to, to be successful in the plans that they've outlined and articulated in their in their plan. Um, and there's a there's a well known, if you like, a well known kind of fact that um, a good management team will you know, potentially succeed even with a, a poor product or service, whereas a bad management team won't succeed even with a good one. So understandably, the equity providers are really focused in on the people. Do they get them? Are they impressive? Um, do they understand their market? Do they understand their route to market? Have they considered the competition? So they'll quiz you pretty hard. And that early due diligence stage on an equity proposition is all about them assessing the extent to which they're impressed by management. So how to approach them? Um, well, in terms of the grants, the scheme itself will, will, will instruct us to how to go, go about it. Set time aside to complete. These things are not easy to do. Take care to follow the application instructions. There will almost always be some kind of word limits that will say that you know, the next section gives you 250 words to explain what your product does. Don't go to 260 because you know some of the application forms won't even permit you to do that. And those that do will uh, almost certainly get um, cut off when that information gets fed to the grant awarding body. Observe the deadlines, pretty obvious. Outputs must be realistically and achievable. Remember there is, albeit a small risk, there is a risk of clawback if you don't deliver on the objectives of the um, the grant project. And again, you know, I would say this would not, but do consider the use of professional bid writers. A lot of them, it's not just, um, you know, going to become a Jerome service. A lot of people out there that do that. In terms of debt, uh, again, I think Tony's covered the uh, credit rating issue and, and the, you know, the preparation in terms of the documents that you're going to need to have at hand, and you might as well make sure that you've got them tidied up and ready to go. Um, so I think Tony's probably covered that off um, quite effectively. But again, um, keep in mind what I mentioned earlier about what the debt providers are looking for. So the, the pitch deck you prefer prepare for them should be quite specific and just flicking back to that previous slide it should all be about serviceability and security the predictability being boring reliable certain steady and low risk because that's what lenders are looking for um, equity again I think Tony's covered off most of these things but make sure the business is investment ready in other words those slides earlier done by Tony um, you know research the potential investors I mean understand them I mean the, to me we do we do um a course on preparing pitch decks and and one of the most common mistakes is that people don't pay any attention to who it is that they're going to be meeting go, go to their website there's no excuse for it today go to their website have a look at them understand what they're looking for what are the companies they've invested in where those might fit with yours is the stuff that you can do that maybe would be you know sort of supportive of their other investments 
Um, again, you know, the current and historical information, I think Tony's covered off adequately. You only get, I know it's corny, but it is true. You only get one chance to make a good first impression. Um, and, and frankly, of all those forms of finance, the one that I really, from the bottom of my heart, could not recommend that you um, proceed to attempt to access without some kind of professional access or advice would be equity. I think that's the most difficult of the three to, to, to do that on your own. Things to watch out for. I mean, the grants is relatively straightforward. There's an eligibility criteria. There'll be some state aid rules or whatever it is that comes after um, uh, after after Brexit. Um, uh, there's um, some rules on when you can commit to spend the money, and generally speaking, you're not allowed to commit to spend the money until the um, uh, the grant has been approved. Uh, there's some sometimes a little bit complicated rules over whether assets under HP or finance lease are permissible. Uh, there's the principle of additionality, uh, which is all about creating stuff that's new um, and that wouldn't always already be created by virtue of just the way the normal market works. So it's it's a complicated principle. I won't have time to describe in detail today, but frankly, you know, it's a, it's the reason why retail is very often ex expressly excluded from grand projects because the general view is that retail would be, um, you know, basically that the, the, the gap in the high street would get filled anyway just by somebody else. Um, um, the claim rules, make sure you're aware of the claim rules. I mean, it, there's a kind of one of those perverse th bits of logic in most grants where there's, it's not uncommon for you to be able to have to convince the grant providers that you need the money in order to do the project and then not uncommonly you have to spend the money first before you can claim it back. So let's not go there. Um, and just be aware of what the clawback provisions are if there are any. Uh, in terms of debt, very important that you review the terms and especially the rules on early repayment. Um, I've put a note in there, funding circle for example is an all or nothing, so you can repay it early but you cannot repay any part of it. Um, you'd have to repay it all. Um, again, arrangement fees, just pay attention to that because there will be some in many cases. The lender will be looking to charge some kind of arrangement fees. Um, administration or service fees, you know, the most common mistake made with invoice discounting or factoring is that people look at the interest rate, whereas actually very often it's the service and administration fees that will dwarf the interest charge over the life of that as a product. Um, again, pay attention, is it fixed or a variable rate of interest? I'm not sure this is always negotiable, but at least be aware of it because clearly you know, interest rates are unpredictable. Um, and again, you might need some help in the deed of priority. So depending on the nature of the debt that's coming in, there may be um, an obligation or a requirement to have that debt right ahead of other existing debt or behind ex pre-existing debt and you'll need some help from a Jerome's organisation or, or other to um, make sure that the deeds of priority are all properly put in place so that everybody understands where they kind of sit in the pecking order. In equity terms there will be an investment or shareholder agreement. Um, they will contain a prohibited activity list so you, you, you'll be shocked to learn that once you've raised the money via equity there'll be a provision within the investment agreement that you can't you can't go out and spend it on a Lamborghini um, so there'll be things that you can't do without the consent of the investor even if that investor owns a, you know a, a relatively minor proportion of the shares of the company you know 10 or 15 percent doesn't matter the bottom line is in order to protect themselves they will they will put into place a prohibited activity list, things you're not allowed to do without their consent. Warranties and indemnities, they will seek them so that if you've gone to them with a plan or a pitch deck and a set of financials, they will want you to say that those were, as best you know them anyway, to be true and accurate in all respects and warranty that. Um, and that protects them against um, anybody mischievously misleading them. Um, you can get advanced assurance for some of the tax schemes I put here, the seed investment, um, enterprise investment scheme, the enterprise investment scheme and the venture capital trust scheme. These are three common means through which 
equities raised with a tax advantage to the investor. Um, and and um, sorry, that was my alarm just telling me I've got to shut up. Um, and then um, and we can get advanced assurance for that. There are um, again in equity, there'll be arrangement fees. Watch out for monitoring fees because it's not uncommon that there'll be some kind of monthly monitoring fees and non-exec fees. I mean, when you add those those things together, the arrangement fees, the monitoring fees, and the non-exec fees, uh, as well as probably arrangement fees, you, uh, you you'll find that the whole thing is quite expensive even in terms of its cash flow implications so be sure it's something you want to go ahead with um, before you proceed to the next stage so those are the kind of main things um, that we wanted to cover off today and we're more or less on time um, Sharon will not be telling me off um, so um, I've covered a lot of stuff as says Tony pr prior to me um, so really then, um, it leaves me only now to just check to see if there are any questions and I'm hoping Sharon will pitch in at this point and let me know whether any appeared on the, um, uh, on, on the uh, Q&A board um, during, the, during the seminar, during the webinar. Sharon? Okay, thank you and, and thank you to those of you that have submitted questions. Um, some of the questions have been covered in the presentation but there are a couple that um, need answering so if i can start with the first question this has got two parts to it so um are you aware of any preferred lenders who are offering any deals on property finance and is it still the most cost effective plan to buy this via a pension plan arrangement don't you want to pick that up or shall i you can pull. okay cool i mean in terms of preferred rates i mean i think Let's start off with the point that property finance is the most um, is the most reasonably costed financial product in the market. So generally speaking, um, you know, any form of finance which has the um, has the benefit of property behind it acting by by, by virtue of security um, will almost always attract the lowest rate. Are we aware that ever offer any preferred rate? Um, I, um, I'd i say no, not specifically, but we do work with a lot of property lenders. In fact, we have a, um, we have a, 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 effectively an arm of Jerome's that deal with, um, that are specialists in the area of property finance. So um, we have a team of people who are probably um, as good as any, if not better than most experts in being able to address that. The other part of that question was, is it the best form? Sorry, repeat the question, Sharon. Was the, the best form to... Um, sorry, is it still the most cost effective plan to buy this via a pension plan arrangement? I think that would entirely depend on the circumstances. I mean, that's a, there's a, there's um, um, and the answer is generally yes, and 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 actually the the reason why the answer is yes is because quite commonly um, the value of the business is not in the property itself um, and and therefore separating the ownership of the property from the business can have uh, the effect of if you like increasing the overall value of the of, of, of the of the you know the portfolio of assets that you own because um, you won't necessarily get the best value for the property selling it within the asset base of the business that said whether it's to do it through your pension scheme is one that would be a combination of our mortgage experts and our tax people and again uh, neither tony or i would um you know be the uh, would proclaim to be the world's authorities on either, but I think that the, the team at Jerome's can advise you on exactly what would be the optimum structure. And there are two teams or effectively two experts would be involved in that advice. One to deal with the tax implications, the other, the um, uh, the, 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 the mortgage. And the advice will probably very much debate on whether it's um, you're buying property for buy to let to other people, or whether you're using it for the commercial use of the business because um if in the buy to let scenario um if you're a sole trader you get in restrictions on the interest relief as if it's a, through a limited company and that tends to work if you have more than five or six properties uh, the uh, limited company or a pension plan is more likely uh, to be more efficient because of the tax relief issue so it depends on the type of property you're you're looking to buy as well sharon any other questions i'm conscious of time 
OK, this may be the last one then. Um, regarding different funding rounds, what are the general gaps between angels, seeding VC and ultimately corporate VCs in regards to company turnover? Yeah, well, again, and it's a good question. And, and frankly, um, you know, I'm going to give you some broad guidelines as an answer to that question, but they are just that. Uh, I could really only say they are broad guidelines because, um, you know, there, there are almost as many exceptions as there are rules to that. I mean, if you like, the traditional journey from an equity fundraising perspective is that the, 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 the early round, the very kind of seed round of investment would involve angels, family and friends, that kind of thing. I mean, I think the Future Fund Scheme has thrown a bit of a spanner into the works on that, so you can potentially do that through debt now, but but historically it's been angels alongside family and friends. Um, and then when you look at bringing in institutional equity in, in, and, and it tends to be development capital providers rather than venture capital providers. I don't want to make too much of a point at the distinction there but development capital providers will generally want to see that you are post revenue um, so if you think of seed and sorry angel and and family friends uh, as being pre-revenue um, early stage development capital is going to want to see post revenue and some reasonably consistent pattern to that post revenue. So in other words, it's not enough just to have made the first sale. You probably are going to need to have secured and it depends a little bit on the proposition and what it is you're selling. If you're selling some of that, you know, um, you sell at a million quid a pop, then maybe one customer will suffice. But if more likely you're selling stuff that, you know, is, is a few hundred pound or a few thousand pound per pop, then they're going to be looking for some evidence of traction, not necessarily hundreds of customers, but maybe maybe tens of customers to come in a dev cap stage. To go to the point then about the later stage, and that's where VCT money comes in. Um, um, and, and by the way, sorry, I include within that angel stage, SCIS investors, um, probably post revenue for EIS and development capital investors. And then if you're really looking to go into raising funding for, um, you know, into the millions for, um, you know, for, for, you know, venture capital trust or VC money, you're probably looking at a ballpark number at, at probably revenue of around a million plus to attract them. So there's a very broad rules, but no revenue for seed or angel. Um, um, probably some post revenue evidence of traction for early stage development capital and then probably a million plus in terms of revenue for a larger check size. No time scale involved, by the way, the, the, the leap between those two stepping stones can be, you know, however long it takes from a business perspective. So it's not a time scale thing. It's more a question of proof that the business has been successful. And just picking up on Paul's point of, of the million pound turnover, it tends to be the run rate of a million pounds. So if month 12 you're doing 100,000 turnover, you're, even though the start of the year you were very low, it's the run rate they look at. So it's not necessarily the last statutory accounts have to show a million pounds. Yeah, good point. That's correct. Yeah. OK, I think that's probably covered most of the questions and those that we haven't had time to address, we'll, we'll come back to you personally on those. Thanks, everybody.